Five seconds. Either one's fine. Welcome to this week's edition of A Deeper Discourse. My name is David Hodel. I'm the editor of the Muscatine Journal. It's Friday, June 3rd, beautiful sunny day, 83 degrees. We're coming uh, to you a little later this week because um, Memorial Day weekend. Um, and so um, I am joined today by Daniel Nitzel. He is the CEO of Fighting Chance Solutions, a um, business that actually started in Muscatine that um, provides equipment to help ensure the safety of uh, classrooms from school shootings. How are you doing today, Daniel? I'm doing well, David. How are you? Doing good, doing good. Hey, um, take a few minutes and tell us about uh, what you guys do over there at Fighting Chance. Well, <laughs> Right now, we're just trying to keep our heads above water, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> we uh, we run an active, like you said, an active shooter safety device company. Uh, we were formed in 2014. Um, we make a product called the Sleeve that it works with all outward swinging doors, which that's how many classrooms are set up. And then we also make a uh, uh, the strongest uh, door bar on the market called the Rampart. Um, we've been around since 2014. We are in every... Oh, every state in the United States, we ship internationally, um, and uh, it's all done right out of here in Muscatine, Iowa. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love the story of how this came to be. Could you, uh, could you tell that again? Tell us how you decided, and, and, and the three of you are all from Muscatine, that the people who founded Fighting Chance Solutions are all born and raised in Muscatine, is that right? Um, yeah, we're all, we all uh, are established here. Not everybody was born in Muscatine, but we're all Muscatine wow. residents. Um, and five out of the six owners, um, it was really interesting. We all worked at the same middle school. Um, used to be called West Middle School. Uh, I think it's Susan B. Clark now. And uh, I was a math and social studies teacher there at the time. And um, we were going through an active shooter training. And... Uh, um, as the, the picture is showing here, most uh, schools have a door closer like that lady is putting our device on. So when I talk about a door closer, that's what I mean, that device in the upper left-hand corner. So we were doing the training in the library, and uh, there were no students at the school that day. It was all faculty, and they went through probably, a, you know, an hour or so um, training and, you know, with lots of video. It was very emotional. And then what they said was, okay, we're going to do a live drill. And... Um, one of the lessons that they learned from the Sandy Hook shooting was that if you're a teacher and your door only locks from the outside, which all of our classroom doors, that's how it was in Muscatine at the time. Um, we weren't, we didn't have the ability to lock from the inside. Um, so they said, because of what happened at Sandy Hook, where a kinder, um, uh, a teacher had stepped out of the hallway to lock her door. Um, when the shooter was down in the kindergarten classroom, uh, the shooter stepped out of the classroom, um, uh, to reload, looked down the hallway, saw the teacher uh, in, in the hallway trying to lock her door, zipped a few shots down, struck the teacher. She was shot and her door was still um, unlocked and uh, her classroom was exposed. So the training was that if you can't, if, if shots are being fired in the hallway, you can't be in the hallway. That makes sense. So what they said was, well, we can't afford push button locks at the time, but one kind of a survival strategy is to go to that door closer up in the corner of the door it's on the inside and take a belt or a cord or, you know, it's kind of funny to say now, but an internet cable. Uh, I know everything's wireless <laughs> now. So to wrap that uh, door closer as tight as you can, kind of like a mummy. And the, 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 the point would be so that those arms can't spread and thus the door can't open. So we're like, all right. So it sounds, sounds simple enough. And so we split up into different classrooms and it was myself and five other teachers in my classroom. And, um, they got on the loudspeaker and they go, active shooter in the building uh, at the office. And so that's part of the training is they want to be more specific now where the shooter is. Don't hide it. 
uh, be specific. So I jumped up on a chair, wrapped, you know, probably took me two minutes. I wrapped some of the best knots in my life or so I thought. Um, and then we went and hit in the corner. What was interesting about this training was the person who was playing the shooter was actually firing a weapon with, lo- with blanks into a bucket. So it was so loud. It was like the adrenaline was going. So we could hear his footsteps coming up to my classroom. And there was kind of this like anticipation and we felt the, we heard the, the footsteps stop and we felt the door handle get grabbed and then one pull and the knots held and we're like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of fist bumping one of the guys next to me like, yeah, we got this. And then uh, the second pull, <laughs> the, the cord sheared in half. He came in and he goes, bang, you're dead, bang, you're dead, bang, you're dead. And he killed us all. So we're like, well, wait a minute, you know, the solution, I get it. You know, we're trying to do the best we can with what we have, but it was kind of a failed solution. Also, it took about two minutes for me to do, and I didn't have any real students in my classroom. And I kind of in the back of my mind knew those weren't real bullets, even though it did kind of heighten my senses. So I was thinking about um, my wife's classroom. She was a kindergarten teacher at the time, and she has two doors. So I was thinking if she had to do this, two doors, She's four minutes into an event that usually the FBI stats are that last between five to six minutes, you know, so she's, you know, two thirds of the way through that. And she hasn't even addressed her kids, which are probably scared to death and it didn't work well. So started to think about, you know, how could we come up with something that kind of utilized the same idea, which is secure that door closer, but to do it in a more efficient and effective way. And that's where we came up. This is the original sleeve this is the exact uh, geometry of my door closer in my classroom i'm try to get that in the camera here <laughs> so this is made out of some very high-tech material basically i took the measurements of my door closer and i cut the top of a rubber bait container i think you can actually see the warning label if i hold it up to the camera <laughs> there uh to avoid <laughs> risk of suffocation do not allow children to play inside this container um i cut it out with a knife and then hot glued it so this is prototype how big was one. that container <laughs> <laughs> it was just the lid. Of, okay. Yeah, it was like those big rubber rubber made containers. Oh, you know, okay. Yeah. Or, I was you know thinking I mean? like a refrigerator container. I'm sorry. Yeah, may, maybe I'm using the wrong the wrong term. Whatever those bins that you store your Christmas lights in, it was one of those. Okay. So I cut that lid up, and just again to test the design. So I went to my classroom the next day. Uh, I tried it out. I had our counselor was in the room, slid it onto the door closer, pulled it a little bit. Obviously, this isn't going to hold much. Um, but it held enough to be like, hey, you know, we might be onto something here. So this is where the sixth owner comes into play. Um, he was my next door neighbor. His name's Carl Negus. I love Carl. Carl's a great guy. Um, he lives right next door to my parents. And I was talking to my parents about this idea. And I'm like, the problem is we can't really, I, you know, I, I teach. So I know I'm getting long winded here. I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll close the loop. Please, uh, please talk, talk as much as you need to. Okay. That's what but that's what we're here for. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I, but basically, I had no way to transfer my idea into something that we could actually test. We knew we know we wanted to do like metal, something strong. So <clears throat> I was talking to my parents, like, hey, you know that guy, our neighbor down there, Carl. Um, he's a you know he's a fabricator, and he might be able to 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 you know do this for you. And I'm like, I don't know. That guy kind of scares me. You know, like I've never talked to him. He's always, you know, he's always smoking a cigar. He's in the shop welding, you know, have a, occasionally a scotch or two. And uh, so I went down there and and uh, I was like, hey, uh, are you Carl? He's like, yeah. And uh, um, I was like, um, I, I kind of have a weird request. I'm like, could do you think you could like turn this into metal? And he's like, uh, I mean, probably. I'm like, we'll pay you. We'll pay you. He's like, what's it for? So this is like where the paranoia comes in because all we ever hear about is like people getting their ideas stolen. It wasn't patented yet. And like, I didn't want to tell him because I didn't know him and which is kind of a dumb idea now, but always protect your intellectual property. And uh, he's like, yeah, sure. And so he, we went through probably 14 different prototypes till we got to what we currently use now. And he produced, he produced probably 12 of them. We just kept going into the school, trying them. Um, and so then we got done and we offered to pay him. And we said, you know, we'll pay you for your work. We don't have a lot of money. Um, but, or you could take some, you know, equity in the company. And uh, smartly, he's like, ah, whatever, I'll, I'll take the equity. 
and uh, it was a smart decision. So um, mm. <clears throat> that's how all of us kind of formed. So what's cool is it, it was myself um, and then our principal who hired me, um, our vice principal, uh, our counselor, and then our art teacher. And early on, like all those guys played such a fundamental role in like bringing their skills and talents to it. You know, like for instance, James, the art teacher, um, he did all our patent drawings and uh, he did our early logo designs. And it was just like cool to see everybody's strengths um, get worked into the company. We had no business experience. Mike Morgan um, was the only one that actually took some business classes at Iowa. So therefore he is our de facto CFO. Um, and we've all learned a lot since then, but honestly, when, when we started, um, I didn't know the difference between gross and net profit. I'm not embarrassed to say that. Like we were that naive. I could write a heck of a lesson plan, but as far as like any business acumen, I just didn't have it. So that's kind of how we developed the product. The The way we kind of exploded, that's a whole different story, so. Okay. Well, I was gonna say you're actually a math teacher. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> In so, fact, I think- Everybody oh, out there, I, I would get this all the time. So mm -hmm. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That is the uh, formula for the Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times I would teach that in eighth grade. Mr. Nitzel, when are we ever going to use this in our life? Well, I built a company. <laughs> <laughs> that is an isosceles this, triangle, basically, isn't it? It's, well, it's a, it's a right triangle without the tip. So the customer okay. only gives us one leg we mandate this leg this is a standard four inches and if they give us this mm -hmm. leg it figures out the hypotenuse perfectly hmm. so the pythagorean <laughs> theorem manifested um there you go yeah it's just been a while right i i never expected to not be a teacher um <laughs> I, I never wanted to not be a teacher but it was we exploded so fast out of the gate in 2014 that it was one of those things where it was like well I mean, somebody's got to run this thing. And, um, you know, it made sense since I was the inventor. Um, and, uh, you know, probably had some strengths that were uh, more fit for that, that it would be me. So, mm -hmm. well, tell us about how you exploded. <laughs> I, I, I actually know the story, but yeah, just yeah. for the for the viewers. Right, so um, so we did all this work for about a year, the pre-work, um, filing for patents. It was a fun process. We built our own website. We had no idea to do that, but we were all working pro bono. We all put in about $2,000 of our own money um, to pay for the patents and also a little bit of seed money, which isn't much, right? You know, 10K to start a business with no, like, there was no real belief that it would turn into what it's turned into. We kind of thought, well, first of all, we want to we want to make these for our classrooms, for our wives. And secondly, maybe it would be like a summer job that we could carpet bag, go around and maybe sell to school districts. Like that was the vision. So we met with the MCC at the time. It was like the entrepreneurship incubator. And they set us up with a great lawyer and just guidance and things like that. And so uh, the president at the time, uh, Buzz Alby, was like, you guys should have a press conference uh, out here at MCC. And immediately, I didn't hesitate. I said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Uh, absolutely not. Like, it's pretentious. You know, who do we think we are? Nobody we, nobody knows who we are. We're not launching the new iPhone. Why are we having a press conference for something that is brand new? And I don't know. I just was kind of insecure about it. It felt pretentious. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, no, 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 we, you really should. And, like, we want to be your first customer. You can be a testing site. So if you have customers that want to come in and see it, we'll have it hanging on all the walls. We're like, oh, we made our first sale. That's great. So... Um, Edwin Cologne, the counselor, one of the owners, um, he pushed me to do it as well. And then we all kind of agreed. So we were getting ready. This is like early June of 2014. And, you know, it was very grassroots. So like Edwin and I remember sitting on our front porch, we were calling like channel eight, channel six, channel seven ourselves, like, you know, trying to make sure they were going to be there, you know? And, uh, but we also knew that if there was so much as a barn fire in Silvis, they probably weren't showing up to some, you know, startup company at Muscatine Community College who nobody's heard of, right? 
So we lucked out. Uh, it was a rainy day, so no one had an excuse to go play golf, and there was not a barn fire in Silvis. So we actually got Channel 4, so CBS, Channel 6, NBC, and uh, Channel 8, ABC, all showed up. And um, we gave the press conference, and um, pretty soon, like, in the middle of it, people's phones started blowing up. So what was happening at the time, unbeknownst to us, um, was that an active shooter situation was unfolding out in Washington State. I can't remember how many students were killed, but that became like the national story, right? So I finished my speaking and then everyone like, there's this real, like kind of a, like a pall in the room and everyone's looking at their phones and everyone had this, has this realization like, wow, this terrible event is unfolding another one of these. And um, here's this group of teachers that had this idea that could help save lives. And like, it was like the light bulbs were all coming on, right? Mm -hmm. So we finished, we wrap up and, uh, you know, we went home and, and uh, I think we went out to lunch with our wives and then we were like, let's go home and watch the news. So we figured we'd be some like puff piece after sports if we were lucky. So we were watching the news and uh, the lead story, of course, was the active shooter situation. And then immediately they followed that tragedy up with. But here's a group of teachers that are doing something about it. And uh, and so we're like, you know, oh, my gosh, we're like the second story. And um, that was great. We all called each other like, that's really neat, you know, that we, we got some publicity and um, so didn't think much of it. I shared actually the, the stories on our Facebook page. So the next morning I wake up, you know, I flip open my computer and have my coffee. I'm like, I'll check Facebook. And, and I checked our page and our story had over a million shares. Um, and I about spit my coffee out on my uh, my computer. And then our business phone started ringing, which was my personal cell phone, which was a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to not have a business line. Um, and it was, it was venture, it was angel investors called. Um, Goldman Sachs called. I, I'm like, <laughs> I'll never forget this. He's like, yeah, this is uh, Stedford Jones from Goldman Sachs. He's like, I'd really like to talk to you. I'm like, I'm like, oh, cool. I'm like, what's Goldman Sachs? <laughs> <laughs> I just, we just didn't know at the time. So we were going viral, <clears throat> unbeknownst to us. And uh, this was kind of the early stages. I mean, it's crazy how fast technology moves. But that was eight years ago. And the idea of, like, going viral was still kind of a newer concept. But that's exactly what was happening. So what had happened was all of the ABC and NBC and CBS affiliates, they put their stories into a pool. And so on all their local broadcasts nationwide, they can pick and choose whatever stories they want to show. Well, almost every ABC, NBC, and CBS affiliate in the United States ended up showing our story from the, the local broadcast. And then it was the craziest 14 days of our lives. Um, I just I got flown out to Hollywood to do daytime TV. We were, I can't tell you how many radio interviews, TV interviews, there were TV trucks parked outside of our headquarters, which was my house. Um, and it was just nuts. We, we had no idea how much we were going to charge because we never expected to need to know that right away after the press conference. So I, I'll never forget the first time we decided, it was dumb thing. the first time we decided how, how much the sleeve should cost, this is literally what we're doing. So like, I'm like a deer in the headlights. Like I can uh -huh. hardly think and we're sitting around, we're all having a glass of scotch, smoking a cigar because like, uh -huh. we're just trying to call it. was crazy. Right. We're working 18 hour days. We're like, well, we got to sell this thing. People want to buy it. So what should we charge? And we literally just went around the room. We didn't look into shipping costs, manufacturing costs. We're just like, someone's like $25. Someone's like a hundred dollars, you know, I mean, just went around and then we settled on <coughs> 65 and uh, the price has changed since then, but that's literally how we determined the the price uh, initially. So it's just been a wild ride. Like we've learned a lot over the last eight years. Sadly, um, we know the cycles of when a, when a big shooting happens, of like what it's going to do with our business, um, the ebbs and flows, how we handle it, how we you know um, we move resources to different areas. It's always interesting. I will say this though: this the Uvalde shooting has uh, behaved differently as far as like website metrics and order intake. Cause usually what happens is we, the shootings happen. And then I know this is kind of inside baseball here, but I find this interesting. People are like, you must be slammed right away. Like well, we're not. And it makes sense that we're not because usually it takes two to three days before we see like kind of that wave come ashore. 
and it's usually pretty big. Hmm. But because the case is that it's two to three days because of the event, then the next day it's all the safety teams are, are planning to meet. They meet. Then on the third, they come up with action items, and then we start hearing from them day three. With this one, it was immediate. Like, it was immediate, and it hasn't stopped. Uh, in fact, I feel kind of bad being on this. I'm honored to be on this interview, but um, there's a lot. We're just trying to keep our heads above water right now. Okay. So when you say keep your heads above water, that's that's in a good way. You've got more business than you know what to do with. It's, it's a good thing. You know, I mean, this is always the mm -hmm. tension with this, right? You know, and I've had to wrestle mm -hmm. with this. I almost We almost sold it after Parkland because... Mm -hmm. Like it gets very emotional. Um, mm -hmm. You will you will hear uh, from from parents of children that have been killed. You'll hear from teachers in the districts. Um, I remember after Parkland, you know, I had a teacher call um, the day after Parkland trying to order a sleeve. She said that, and I, God knows why they had school in the Parkland district the day after, but they did. And she said, "I'm scared. Like the lights are off. We've had a, a, a bomb threat at our school. I'm trying to order the sleeve, and then just talking through people." Um, you know, calming them down, listening to them. Uh, you kind of become part counselor, you know, part business owner. Um, I had a mom call uh, from the Vegas shooting, um, you know, and, and ordering product for her school. And she talked about how it was the first time she had let her twin daughters, I think they were 17. It was her first concert. She let them go to alone. They were both shot in the head um, from that assassin and, uh, they both lived, but they were both in the intensive care unit. And so you can just imagine, like, we've heard from people from Sandy Hook, from Columbine. Um, it's, it gets, it, so my point is like, it gets emotional. Um, and it's, so keeping your head above water is like answering phone calls, fulfilling orders, getting back to emails, um, and then just kind of the emotional ups and downs. Um, but, you know, that's also what they pay me to do. And, and we know we're doing we're doing good work. You know, there's that tension is kind of what I started this with, where some people say, well, are you profiting off of tragedy? And I, I've had to fight with that because we do make money when these things happen, for sure. You know, there's no doubt. Um, but I get reassured because people are like, listen, like you are doing things that are trying to help. And there are a lot of things out of people's control. Um, many debates that people get into that I have no control over. My locus of control is that I can provide something that wasn't there before and um, help secure classrooms and synagogues and churches and universities and government buildings. And I take great pride in that. And, and our devices have been used in active shooter situations and listed door breaches. Um, that's, that is, that makes it all worth it. Like I remember the first time we got that story that we are, we had a sleeve used in an active shooter situation and it was stood a door breach, burst into tears, like just emotional. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause we know the product works, but also there's that little, it's a little seed of doubt. Like until you see it in action, um, mm -hmm. it really needs to be used. Like, yeah, it, it made it all worth it. So. Okay. Well, yeah, I was going to say, uh, you're, I, I don't see you guys profiting on tragedy. It, it seems like you're profiting on, the desire to avoid a tragedy. Uh, well, I appreciate you me. being my therapist there. I, I do. Um, <laughs> but people do say that, people will say that, you know, and I need to stay out of the comment mm -hmm. sections. Like, it's hard. I okay. take this very personally. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's why I have two phones now. Because we actually, okay. we have to keep that. We had to keep the original phone number because it's listed on a lot of the articles. 563-506-4231. That is still the original company phone number. Um, so I walk mm -hmm. around, I, people are like, oh, two phones. Uh, and I'm like, you have no idea. Like, I just had to separate my life. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, you, you, you have, you, you were telling me you've talked with survivors of, of many tragedies. Yes. So what? I got to get a charge. I'm sorry, what? Uh, I got to charge my computer. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what sorts of things have you learned? What uh, what pieces of knowledge have you come away from talking with them, knowing you know what what can be used to help prevent something like that from happening in the future? That's a broad. It's a broad question, but it's a very 
Good question. I mean, I think that people realize that they can only control what they can control, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the best thing that they can do is to be proactive and to try to prevent these things from happening. And, and if, you know, uh, if, you know, God help you, you are in one of these situations, you know, that you're as prepared as possible. Um, you know, I've, I'm an active, I'm a trained active shooter um, teacher um, through Alice. You know, I've learned a lot through that. You know, it's little things like, you know, when you're in a restaurant, um, are you facing the door? Have you identified your exits? Um, if you're in a classroom, what is the safest corner to be in? Um, do you have small things on hand? Like, so there's some hacks that, you know, I've learned and, and people have told me, so you can't, you can't have weapons in school. You can't have mace in school. Uh, but you know what you can have in school? A 30 foot wasp spray. Um, that would blind an assailant if they came through the door and you could be standing in the corner. Um, stuff like that, having having a window hammer if your windows don't open and a, a heavy wool cloth. I noticed that in some of those pictures you, from Uvalde, they were smashing out the windows and the first responders were providing wool blankets, but a wool blanket costs 12 bucks on Amazon and a uh, one of those emergency car hammers um, is, you know, like four dollars. And, you know, it's just like little things like that. Just being prepared, not being paranoid. Like, we can't live in fear, um, but also you can, there are some things that you can do um, to take back some control in a situation where it doesn't feel like there's much control. So it's just being proactive. That's probably the biggest thing that I pulled away from these conversations. And then just honestly, like the hurt, like even if, even if your child isn't killed, like these people's lives will never be the same. The things that their children saw, the emotions that their parents felt, like this has, so many reverberations um, further than just the immediate community, immediate families. And we feel it, you know, we feel it as parents, we feel it as teachers. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, there, there it is. You see the blanket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So I don't know. I, it's just hard. Like this is an awful situation and just an awful okay. situation. Do you have something, um, for example, we had a tragedy, Last night here in Iowa, up in Ames, I don't know if you would have heard about it. I, I uh, did. I heard about it. You did hear about it? Do you have any maybe advice for individuals as far as staying safe? Just be aware of your surroundings. Um, I'm very aware when I'm in church or, um, you know, pretty much anywhere now. And hmm. some people might call me paranoid, but I am looking for people that are acting... Um, a little nervous, um, kind of looking around. Um, somebody I don't notice that I haven't really, you know, seen in an area that I'm in a lot. You know what I mean? Um, at the end of the day, you cannot prevent these things. Um, I just I don't see any way possible. But um, you know, I think just being aware of your surroundings is important. Sounds like I, I heard a little bit of information about the AIM shooting. That's a real tough one. And, you know, that's what they call a targeted kill, where mm -hmm. someone has decided that they are going to kill a person. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a specific individual. I think it was his girlfriend I heard and then another person. Those ones, those are really tough. The, I consider it, it's almost like a kamikaze pilot. And that's the thing is, like, if you have an angry person trying to get to one person in a, in, in a room, they're probably going to find a way to get in. You know, the, so the goal is to, to delay, delay as long as possible the good guys get there but at the end of the day when I mean, you have someone that's that crazy that, that is looking to end a life and end theirs that that's really hard to avoid um, but just be aware of your surroundings you know those are little things okay how does that carry over into school shootings i would imagine it'd be much the same if there's somebody who's doesn't care if he's going to live through this and wanting to do some kind of harm it would be kind of difficult to stop him, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, there are things that schools can do and there are funds um, that, that are available. Um, you know, like Sandy Hook had they, what they call a security vegetable, where it's like the, the, the door, they come into a secure um, foyer and they have to buzz <laughs> in. Well, he just shot through the glass and then shot through the other glass. So, you know, I know many schools um, have bulletproof glass film 
Um, I've never been a proponent of militarizing the school, you know, like walking through metal detectors, um, you know, seeing, uh, you know, people walking around, the, the people are talking about having armed guards. You know, I think it's great to have a resource officer. I think that's awesome. But some people are talking about having, you know, um, former military standing guard with their, you know, with their rifles outside of schools. I mean, kids, I think I told you in the interview that you have to find a balance because when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's a triangle, right? And at the peak of the triangle, that's where you're trying to get. That's self-actualization. That's like living your best life. At the very base uh, is safety and security. And you cannot start to climb up the ladders of Maslow's hierarchy of needs if you don't feel safe and secure. So kids need to feel safe, but also they can't feel scared. So I think things like having push button locks, I know Muscatine School District uh, made a large investment a number of years ago in the uh, active shooter door locks, uh, making sure those work. I always like having redundancy. I think the sleeve is great as a redundancy. Having things like wasp spray, having uh, you know maybe the foyer of your building, have some of that bulletproof film. Kids don't know that it's bulletproof. It's, it's a simple 3M film they can put over. Um, just simple things like that, where I think you can balance safety with a sense of, um, you know, not feeling like you're in a jail. Okay. So what's next for um, Fighting Chance Solutions? Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Right now, it's just okay. survival. So, you know, okay. making sure we're getting product out on time, making sure our supplier is keeping up with, uh, you know, the production. Um, I haven't really moved on to that next kind of what's next. I mean, okay. I also don't want to overcomplicate things. We do what we do very well. And we have tens of thousands of satisfied customers nationwide. And, you know, in a way, I don't want to expand too much. Um, but we have some ideas. There's some things we're working on. We just need to get time. We need some time to do it. Um, we bought another company and um, we're trying to... to you know, get used to that and learn that. And then this happened. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you foresee this type of thing? It seems like we've had a, um, maybe a, a peak of violent situations throughout the country. Do you think that this is going to continue? Yeah, it hasn't peaked. This is, and I, I hate to, this, this is the worst Monday morning quarterback thing but it's the truth, like, this is predictable, you know, mm -hmm. after two and a half years of what we've gone through, we've been saying this all along. In, in a way, I guess I am surprised that it's been this severe, but people have been through such emotional uh, tragedy, physical tragedy, financial tragedy, um, people are desperate. Mental illness was already an issue going into the pandemic and the, you know, um, the, the tumultuous summer of 2020 and uh, and then, you know, threat of war with, uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine. And then I'm, I'm, I know I'm missing stuff, but like, no, this is the, the, the times are not great. And you're seeing that people have, feel like they have nothing to live for. And that's what scares me is I'm seeing more and more desperation. Um, yeah, I, I, this isn't surprising. And I don't think we've reached a peak. I hate to say that, but, um, you know reading the signs of the time i don't know i've i've often referred to it as a mental health issue i to an extent i might be wrong it might very well be becoming a societal issue that this seems to be what's being produced if you know what i'm saying there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of tribalism it is. Uh, we feel more divided than ever um, nobody wants to listen to the other side um and, and that can go with anything um you know, uh, it doesn't just have to be politics. And uh, there's just a lot of anger and hurt. And, you know, uh, when someone gets backed into a corner or feels backed into a corner, you know, it's uh, you either uh, you give up or you come out fighting. And uh, I'm just worried that we have a lot of people backed into corners right now and they don't feel like they have any escape. And uh, it's just a very dark time. So tell me, uh, somebody interested in ordering a sleeve or a, um, I don't know what you call it. It's not the club. The, ramp it's, the rampart? Yes. How, how would they go about doing that? 
Yeah, so um, we're an entirely online store. We keep it off of Amazon for a reason. We want everyone to work directly through us. FightingChanceSolutions.com is our website. Uh, our phone number is 888-559-6412. It's at the, the top of our website there. Um, you can call us. You can email us. You can order directly online. We accept purchase orders. We accept credit cards. And that's kind of a unique feature because uh, we deal with so many schools that um, you can basically purchase and just put your PO number in. You don't have to exchange any money. Um, we just know that we've got your purchase order number and, and uh, you can submit your order. We get your product on the road. Well, hey, I was going to say we've talked about quite a few things here. Um, is there anything else you care to add or anything I forgot to ask? I don't think so. Uh, we, we covered a lot, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope everyone stays safe. And, and you know, also I do want to re uh, reiterate, we love this town. This is a Muscatine company. I'm very proud of that. Uh, mm -hmm. We try to keep as much as we can local, um, and uh, that's always our plan. So, um Thank you, David, and, and uh, thank you, Muscatine. It's a great town to live in and, and, and grow your kids um, up in. So I think I'm stumbling. Okay. I, think I, got, I think I'm having my brain is short-circuiting, so I better get back out. <laughs> the phone hey, ringing, thank looking you. at the cameras, and <laughs> I'm okay. starting to get a little nervous. So. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for agreeing to be with me, and you be sure to have a good rest of your day. You too. Thank you. And thank you again for joining me again today. This has been Friday, June 3rd. And don't forget, if it's Friday, it must be Muscatine.